Warning, there will be some images that may make some viewers uncomfortable. From the dawn of American history, racial stereotypes have played a significant role in shaping attitudes toward African Americans. But where did these stereotypes originate and how do they still impact society today? This video will dive into seven historical racial stereotypes of African Americans, exploring their origins, real life examples, and their relevance in today's world. Welcome to the legacy of African American folk tales, where we use folk tales to examine culture and history, bringing context to our modern world. If you haven't joined our inquisitive and passionate family yet, hit the subscribe button and mash the notification bell because you don't want to miss an update. From the moment enslaved Africans reached America, they brought invaluable folklore, songs and dances. However, cultural treasures like tap dancing, the banjo and Brer Rabbit were twisted to support slavery and Jim Crow. In examining seven key stereotypes, we'll debunk myths and highlight how folk tales countered prevailing narratives, celebrating the profound legacy of African-American folklore. Let's dive in. First on our list, number one, the Sambo. The Sambo stereotype portrays African-Americans as simple-minded, docile individuals often seen as the happy slave. White slave owners molded African-American males into this image of a jolly, overgrown child happy to serve his master. This stereotype dates back to the colonization of America and was used to justify the institution of slavery. While Sambo was depicted as a perpetual child, the coon was an adult who acted childishly. That boy showing you how to fly right. Stephen Fetchett, whose real name is Lincoln Perry, stands as a notable figure in Hollywood and is recognized as the first black movie star to earn $1 million. He often portrays a stereotypical lazy and foolish African-American character. While he achieved fame, his roles come under scrutiny for perpetuating negative racial stereotypes. Mel Watkins' biography, Stephen Fetchett, The Life and Times of Lincoln Perry, suggests that his act may be a continuation of the trickster tradition from the slavery era, where slaves outwit their oppressors by feigning ignorance. Side note, this scene shows Stephen Fetchett acting with Hattie McDaniel, another actress you will hear about later in this video. Hey, cut them monkey shines. How you expect the judge to win that croquet game with no solace in his stomach? Watkins believes that Fetchett's portrayal can be viewed as a form of subversion, exploiting white audiences' sense of superiority. Yet the legacy of Stepin Fetchett is controversial, as his comedic style, once celebrated, now faces criticism, leading to his distance from both Hollywood and the black community. The ongoing debate about his legacy prompts questions regarding the role of African-American performers in shaping public perceptions and self-images. Brer Rabbit and High John the Conqueror are emblematic figures in African-American folklore. Brer Rabbit is a trickster, celebrated for their cunning and wit in outsmarting oppressive forces. Rather than resorting to brute force, they deftly navigated challenges, using their intelligence to turn situations to their advantage. Which leads us to this question, was Stippin Fetchett subverting expectations like Brer Rabbit so he could become a millionaire? Or was he a victim of a broken system? What do you think about this? Please share your thoughts and comment below. By the 1900s, Sambo was identified with older, docile black people who accepted Jim Crow laws and etiquette, whereas coons were increasingly identified with the young, urban black people. Essentially, a coon, short for raccoon, was a Sambo who had gone bad. Do you see traces of the Sambo or coon in modern entertainment? Let us know in the comment section. Next up, number two, Jim Crow. Jim Crow was a theatrical stereotype portraying African Americans as buffoons. White performers would darken their faces and exaggerate features to entertain audiences. Minstrel shows were the first American-made form of entertainment, predating even Broadway. These shows featured white performers in blackface, caricaturing African Americans, depicting black people as lazy, ignorant, and superstitious. And guess what? They were insanely popular, not just in America, but internationally. Minstrel Z left its mark on vaudeville, early film, and even modern music and comedy. The term Jim Crow originated as a minstrel character. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. The character they portrayed was named Jim Crow, 
a city dandy, which was a counterpart to the southern plantation darky known as Sambo. The name Jim Crow was popularized by performer T.D. Rice, who was inspired by an old crippled black man he saw dancing in the street. This dance, a shuffle where the feet never left the ground, was an adaptation by African Americans to a law that prohibited them from dancing. When Rice performed this dance in 1830, it became an instant sensation, leading to widespread performances of the Jim Crow by white actors across the North. This caricature, Jim Crow, became a powerful and enduring image of the black man, especially in regions where many had never interacted with African Americans. The portrayal perpetuated harmful stereotypes, suggesting that African Americans were buffoons, which had a lasting impact. Even today, the legacy of this character is evident in the controversial practice of blackface, a painful reminder of racial prejudices and stereotypes. Jim Crow became shorthand for laws that demeaned African Americans. The term Jim Crow now refers to laws that enforced racial segregation. By the 1920s, theatrical minstrel shows were declining, but they would have a big influence on film and television. Amos and Andy was a radio sitcom about black characters with humor rooted in minstrel show tradition. From the 1920s until 1960, the radio show was immensely popular and one of the first major radio sitcoms. In the tradition of Jim Crow performers, Charles Carell and Freeman Gosden, two white actors created, wrote and voiced the characters on the radio show. In the 1930s, a movie based on the radio show had these actors appear in blackface. While it had a three-year stint in the 1950s on television with black actors, the radio show was predominantly voiced by Carell and Gosden. The legacy of Amos and Andy introduced another stereotype we will talk about later in this video. Number three, the brute caricature has historically portrayed black men as inherently savage, animalistic, and criminal, deserving of punishment or even death. Movies like Birth of a Nation portrayed African Americans as savages that needed to be tamed. This image painted black men as terrifying predators, especially targeting white women, and was used to justify heinous acts like lynching. This stereotype gained traction post-emancipation. Pioneering black filmmaker Oscar Michaud actively countered negative stereotypes in early Hollywood. Born to former slaves, Michaud sought to challenge the prevailing racist narratives by producing films that showcased the dignity, humanity, and complexity of black lives. His films, like Within Our Gates, directly responded to racist films like The Birth of a Nation, by presenting a more accurate depiction of American history, highlighting the senseless violence black families faced from racist mobs. Michaud's work was revolutionary, offering an alternative to the demeaning roles available to black actors in mainstream Hollywood and providing black audiences with relatable, empowering narratives. Keep watching to hear more about how independent film has been able to challenge Hollywood's stereotypes and make sure to mash the subscribe button for more videos like this. Look at this magazine cover. It's LeBron James and Giselle Bündchen on the cover of Vogue. The first time Vogue would feature an African-American man on their cover. It stirred controversy because the image reminded many of King Kong, a film whose original 1933 release had racial undertones. But was the controversy overblown? Some pointed out that the image was actually inspired by this World War I propaganda image, which depicted Germans as brutish guerrillas holding Lady Liberty. While the World War I propaganda image uses the word brute, what do you think? Was this controversy overblown, or given the historical context of the brute stereotype, was it too far? Let us know what you think in the comment section. Over time, the term brute has evolved, with the modern-day term thug, often being used in media and societal discourse, carrying with it similar negative connotations and stereotypes. The Mammy. The Mammy is an image of a large, independent African-American woman, often seen serving white families. While Hattie McDaniel's role as Mammy in Gone with the Wind showcased her talent. But did you know the depth she brought to this character? She transformed Mammy from a stereotype to a figure of resilience and humanity. As African Americans replaced white blackface performers, actors were able to push back on racial tropes of the time. Hattie McDaniel refused to say the N-word on screen. 
although the word was written in the shooting script and throughout the original book of Gone with the Wind. Other actors would follow. In addition, the Pittsburgh Courier, an African-American newspaper, pressured the producer of Gone with the Wind not to include the hate word in the movie. Thankfully, this word would not appear in the film. This dedication led her to be the first black actress to win an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. But while many celebrated her achievement, many critics argued she perpetuated racial cliches. It would take another 50 years before another black woman, Whoopi Goldberg, would be honored with the Best Supporting Actress Oscar for her role in Ghost. It wasn't until 2011 that Octavia Spencer would join this exclusive list, winning the same award for her portrayal in The Help. Okay, wait, 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 hold on. Jennifer Hudson would win for Dreamgirls and then Monique would win for Precious. Fun fact, Monique paid homage to Hattie McDaniel with her outfit. Octavia Spencer won in 2011. Afterward, Lupita Nyong'o won for 12 Years a Slave, Viola Davis won for Fences, and Regina King won for If Beale Street Could Talk, all in the Best Supporting Actress category. To date, Halle Berry is the only African-American woman to win a Best Actress Oscar for Monsters Ball. We'll get back to her later. Okay, back to Octavia Spencer. That Octavia Spencer would join this exclusive list, winning the same award for her portrayal in The Help, a role that sparked discussions about typecasting and the portrayal of black women in Hollywood. After I did The Help, I was all excited about the possibilities that were to come. And 90% of the role was like, we have this great role for you, and it was a maid. And we have this wonderful role, DA, it was a maid. For some of these actors, winning an Oscar didn't give them more diverse roles to play. Many, like Octavia Spencer, began producing films that gave them the roles they wanted to play. An example of artists taking their careers into their own hands Another stereotype closely related to the Mammy is Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima is associated with domestic work, especially cooking. The Aunt Jemima brand, which used this stereotype to sell products, became a fixed image associating African-American women with domestic work. Nancy Green, a name perhaps unfamiliar to many, was the original face behind the Aunt Jemima trademark. Born into slavery, Green moved to Chicago and became a living embodiment of the Mammy character, first at the 1893 World's Fair and later with a lifelong contract for the Pancake Company. Beyond the commercial image, Green was a philanthropist and ministry leader. The recent rebranding of Aunt Jemima products shows a move away from the stereotype, with efforts now underway to commemorate her true legacy as the character she portrayed begins to fade. The magical Negro trope, a term that has been deeply embedded in literature and film, is a portrayal of African-American characters who possess mystical abilities, primarily to aid white protagonists. This trope, while seemingly positive on the surface, is rooted in racial stereotypes and often neglects the depth, agency and needs of the black characters themselves. The origins of this trope can be traced back to the way African-American folktales were appropriated and repurposed to cater to white audiences. One of the earliest and most prominent examples is the character of Uncle Remus in Joel Chandler Harris's Tales and Disney's Song of the South adaptation. Uncle Remus, a storyteller, uses folktales to guide and assist the white characters, while his own needs and desires remain secondary or entirely unaddressed. This pattern of using black characters as tools for white character development is evident in various works. For instance, the 1852 play adaptation of Uncle Tom's Cabin presents Uncle Tom as a moral slave who, despite enduring immense suffering, consistently forgives and serves his white masters. His portrayal is deeply influenced by Christian sentimentality, positioning him as a saintly figure who prioritizes the needs of white characters over his own. Such portrayals, while seemingly elevating black characters, actually perpetuate harmful stereotypes and deny them agency and depth. The trope continues to manifest in modern films. In The Green Mile, John Coffey, a black man with magical abilities, is portrayed as a gentle giant who uses his powers to aid white characters, even at the cost of his own life. 
Similarly, in the film Ghost, Oda Mae Brown, a spiritual advisor, serves as a medium to help the white protagonists, further reinforcing the trope. Molly, you in danger, girl. What are you talking about? I know the man who killed me. He knows the man who killed It's important to understand the black experience beyond the confines of this trope. While the magical Negro trope may seem like a positive representation on the surface, it is essential to delve deeper and understand its historical and cultural implications. True representation means portraying characters with depth, agency and authenticity, moving beyond stereotypes and acknowledging the rich tapestry of experiences that define the African-American community. Did you know Splash Mountain was based on slave narratives? Disney's 1941 movie, Song of the South, is a Disney version of the Uncle Remus tales by Joel Chandler Harris. Although Brer Rabbit existed in African-American folk tales for centuries before Joel Chandler Harris published his 1880 series, Joel Chandler Harris created Uncle Remus, inspired by Uncle Tom. Before Brer Rabbit stories were retold with Uncle Remus and Disney, these tales were about enslaved communities outsmarting the plantation system, using their wits instead of brute force. In 1989, Disney released a ride in Disneyland called Splash Mountain based on these Broyer Rabbit Tales and Song of the South. Please leave a comment below and let us know what you think. Number 6. A more confrontational stereotype is the Sapphire. The Sapphire stereotype portrays black women as strong-willed, sassy and domineering, often at the expense of black men. This stereotype gained significant traction with the character Sapphire from the radio and television show Amos and Andy. Sapphire Kingfish's wife was depicted as a nagging, loud and aggressive woman, reinforcing the stereotype. Shows like Sanford and Son, with characters like Aunt Esther, who was often in conflict with the main character, Fred Sanford, have also perpetuated this stereotype. Who cares? My God, if you leave and I'm going with you, honey, because your father's getting on my nerves. Such portrayals have contributed to the broader societal perception of black women as perpetually angry or confrontational. The trope has persisted over the years, with the angry black woman label being a modern manifestation, overshadowing the diverse experiences and personalities of black women in reality. As African Americans were given more chances to write and direct films, you see that black artists are given more humanity. No longer is it just an angry black woman. There is nuance and justification for what caused her anger. Yeah, Faith, my husband. Can we talk about this? Can we talk about what? The actors who portrayed these roles added humanity to what could have been stereotypical roles. In the independent spirit of Oscar Michaud, independent filmmakers are able to challenge stereotypes and push representation a step forward, even if Hollywood lags behind. Filmmakers like Spike Lee and Robert Townsend would use satire to comment on Hollywood's troublesome tropes. Robert Townsend's Hollywood Shuffle and Spike Lee's Bamboozled held a mirror to the challenges Hollywood faces in representing authentic African-American stories. Spike Lee's Bamboozled is a scathing satire that delves into the perpetuation of racial stereotypes in media. The film follows TV producer Pierre Delacroix as he creates a modern-day blackface variety show as a subversive attempt to highlight the racism in the entertainment industry. But the show becomes a massive hit, revealing the deeply ingrained prejudices of the audience. Lee's film serves as a powerful commentary on the minstrel shows of the past to the modern media portrayals. Bamboozled was released over two decades ago. Do its themes resonate with us today? Leave a comment below and let us know what you think. Lastly, the Jezebel. The Jezebel stereotype portrays African-American women as promiscuous and seductive. Dorothy Dandridge's portrayal of Carmen in Carmen Jones was a double-edged sword. While the film catapulted her to global fame, her character, Carmen, embodied many stereotypes, including the Jezebel trope, which paints black women as seductive temptresses. This portrayal, while groundbreaking in its time, also tied Dandridge to the Jezebel archetype. That's 
suggest that while you're on this ship, you wear something a little less revealing. Does it bother the captain? In the Bible, Jezebel was the notorious wife of King Ahab of Israel. She was known for promoting the worship of false gods, leading Israel into idolatry. Her actions and influence were so profound that her name became synonymous with wickedness and deceit. Jezebel has evolved from its biblical origins to become a stereotype used to label and demean women, painting them as seductive temptresses, much like how Dorothy Dandridge's role in Carmen Jones was perceived. Dorothy Dandridge was disappointed with her typecasting. She stated, America was not geared to make me into a Liz Taylor, a Monroe, a Gardner. My sex symbolism was as a wanton, a prostitute, not as a woman seeking love and a husband, the same as other women. Dorothy Dandridge would be the first African-American woman nominated for Best Actress for her role in Carmen Jones. Forty-seven years later, Halle Berry would be the first and only black woman to win an Oscar for Best Actress for her performance in Monsters Ball. A role that many people would highlight required her to engage in a sexual relationship with a racist white man in the film, recalling the dynamics of the Jezebel stereotype. This demonstrates again that black actors, even in modern times, still are navigating these tropes in the roles they portray. Interestingly, Halle Berry portrayed Dorothy Dandridge in the HBO film, introducing Dorothy Dandridge three years before Monster's Ball. The script to introduce Dorothy Dandridge was written by Shonda Rhimes, the creator of Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, and How to Get Away with Murder. Fast forward to modern times, the term Jezebel, has been weaponized against powerful black women, including Vice President Kamala Harris, who was derogatorily labeled as such by some critics, revealing the dangerous persistence of this trope in contemporary discourse. While these stereotypes may have started on the stage or in media, they have real-world impact in how black women and men are framed and depicted in our society. What do you think? Are these still problems we face? Let us know in the comment section below. While we've come a long way from the blatant racial stereotypes of the past, their echoes can still be seen in today's society. By understanding their origins and impact, we can work towards a more inclusive and understanding future. We'll also examine how African-American artists pushed back against stereotypes through their art, culminating in performances, satire and television shows that added humanity to what were once stereotypical roles. In terms of Hollywood's portrayal of black artists and their humanity, it is acknowledged that there may be limitations. However, regardless of this, there will always be narratives that black individuals tell about themselves, encompassing African-American folk tales, as well as contemporary stories, featuring fully developed characters. Thank you for watching the video till the end. Kindly subscribe and enable notifications to stay updated on new videos. Until next time, this is the legacy of African-American folktales.